So, okay. So welcome to Humanities One. This course is going to be covering ancient and medieval humanities. So if you have never taken a course in humanities, you need to know that this is a pretty broad area of study. And what I'm going to do is provide lectures with some visuals and PowerPoints throughout the semester. Okay, so I'm going to try to get all of these things um, uploaded for you guys so that you guys can follow the material and have everything you need to be successful in the class. But our first session is just going to be an introduction to humanities. You know, what is humanities? So let me go ahead and bring you over to the show, the PowerPoint. Uh, this is very basic. Um, it's going to take me a while to, to build all the, the PowerPoints, but I'm going to try to keep them somewhat consistent throughout the semester. Um, anyways, what is humanities? Let's do an introduction. Uh, whoops. All right, so I've already got things frozen. Wonderful. All right, let me hold on a second and let me fix this problem. Okay, I think I've got it fixed. Sorry about that. Um, just a little glitch. The question I was going to kind of open to you, I usually do a poll somewhere around here to see what you guys think humanities is. Like I said, most of you have probably never taken a class in humanities. So, you know, I give you a very basic definition here of humanities as a study of cultural expression. And it doesn't tell you very much. A um, little blurb here that, you know, form and content, whatever those are, of our expressions is supplied in some type of context, which we call a historical ideological context. So there's a lot of vocabulary already being thrown out at you guys, so I want to unpack a little bit of this as we go. And the first thing we probably need to hit is this idea of culture, because I think you know what an expression is, right? It's a way that we um, display our culture or communicate our culture through various media. Okay, or various methods. But what exactly is culture? So I'll let you guys try to answer that. Anybody have an idea about what culture is? You could type it, you could unmute your microphone if you want to kind of shout out what you think culture is. It's a broad term, so a lot of possible correct answers. You can give me, if not necessarily a definition of culture, but maybe an element of culture. We actually have a course at the college called uh, Cultural Studies. It's actually one of the, the, the coolest classes I teach. I haven't really told you very much about myself uh, and what I teach at the college, which I, okay, tradition. Uh, yeah, uh, uh, yes, cultures have traditions, okay? The um, Cultural Studies class, you can keep texting things in as I'm talking, but uh, if you're ever interested in the cultural studies class, uh, this is how I run my term abroad program. So we do terms abroad every once in a while. I haven't done one in uh, a couple semesters. And definitely with the, the COVID situation, we're not uh, planning on any coming up anytime soon. But uh, we've done terms abroad to Greece, Italy, Turkey, uh, France, Spain. Uh, I think those are pretty much the countries that we've hit. Usually hit a couple countries at a time, but uh, it's a lot of fun. It really is good for people interested in the type of material we're covering in this particular course because it's uh, a lot of overlap, particularly when we go to Greece and Italy. So, yeah, social behavior uh, is something that is a manifestation of culture. Good. Um, the collective beliefs, right, we pass these down. That goes back with that idea of traditionality. So, yeah, we could say in a broad, broad way, a culture is a way of life or at least the characteristics that a particular group has that define their way of life. But again, that is incredibly broad, right? And that would include things as diverse as dance, style of clothing, language, food, stories. Um, all those different types of things are characteristics of culture. We need to get a little bit more focused because we can't obviously cover everything like that in a course like this. So our definition for culture is going to be restricted to the artistic and intellectual expressions, right, and achievements of a people. So we're going to be looking at the artistic side of things. We're going to be looking at the intellectual um, products uh, of, of a culture. And we'll talk about which cultures those are going to be in a second. 
Okay, but first let's ask the question why we bother studying this kind of stuff. Why does a college like ours require people to have humanities credits? Why do um, why is that mandatory? What, what's important about this? Why do colleges across the nation continue to have courses like this offered? Any ideas? A lot of people think of college as preparation for a career. And this doesn't seem to necessarily be geared towards any particular job, unless you're going to go into a job like mine. So, all right, to gain perspective, good, which is really important. No matter what job you do end up going with, you're going to be dealing with people and having, you know, perspective on humanity is really important. I mean, that's where the name human, uh, human, humanities comes from is um, us, right? Other ideas. And if you guys have, uh, have have any of you guys taken a class like this before? <clears throat> Tell you the truth, some of your names actually look familiar to me. I don't know, maybe you were in my mythology class in the past. That's a type of humanities class. As a matter of fact, it's called Myth in Human Culture. So we're looking at myths from different cultures. Okay, cool. Some of you have. Anthropology also, very good, is similar. Uh, you know, Anthropology is a study of human culture. Um, social science perspective. Uh, so there's a lot of overlap with some of these things. So let me give you some of the reasons I have come up with for why you should study humanities. Uh, number one, to connect with a process, right, that brought us to this place, this time in history. Um, the, the culture that you are currently in, and that's a really poor way of you know, describing things because you're really not in a culture. Uh, you are the product of multiple cultures and probably parts of multiple cultures. There are subcultures within cultures, um, different groups we associate with. But whatever that is, or whatever those are, there's been a process historically that brought us to this place, right? Our culture just didn't just you know pop into existence out of nowhere. We have elements taken from all the people that preceded us and all the cultures that preceded us. And it's good to be connected to that process and understand how we got here, right? Uh, which is related to the next one being, you know, escape being just subject to our times, which often come with misconceptions. We think that, you know, certain things that are going on today are unique to us. And in many ways, they're not. In many ways, human beings have been the same from the beginning, have asked the same major questions, and sometimes even came up with the same answers. But at the same time, there's radical differences between people of other cultures and times and our own. So there are these similarities and differences, both of which make some of the stuff, I think, fascinating. Um, I don't know if anybody's heard of that quote, actually that reference, um, nothing new under the sun, ECCL period. It's one possible abbreviation for anybody know what? This is where uh, kind of cultural literacy comes into play, which is another reason to study humanities. You learn more of the references that actually come again at you, you know, all the time, right? You're on YouTube, you're uh, watching this video, that video, you're talking to people in different situations, you get a job, you're, you know, in a meeting, you're um, at a lunch meeting, you're talking with people, and they'll say things that reference things from the past. Um, the more you know, the more you're able to just follow a conversation, be able to connect with people. Ecclesiastes, very good. All right, so uh, a lot of you may have never heard of Ecclesiastes, maybe not know where that's found. Um, I'd say even if you have heard of it, you may have never read it. It's a, it's a book found in what collection of books? Anybody know? I'm assuming the person that wrote that answer also knows where it's found. You could use, you know, yeah, the Tanakh, very good. It's in the Hebrew scriptures. It's a, a book in what the Christians would call the Old Testament. Um, and there's a truth to that, right? Not, there's nothing new under the sun. Everything is the same. There are whole philosophical systems and religious systems about, that believe everything repeats itself, right? There's a great cycle that we're all part of, and there's just repetition upon repetition. Anyways, um, we want to escape ignorance. That nobody wants to be called ignorant, by the way. I don't think um, it's a compliment when somebody says you're ignorant. So again, the more you learn, the more you avoid ignorance, but it's kind of a weird thing. The more you learn, the more ignorant you're actually going to feel. I, I constantly feel this way. The, the more I read, the more I study, the more I realize, man, there's still a lot out there that I need 
to, to learn. Um, and that's an interesting phenomenon. The more ignorant you are, the more confident you actually are in your knowledge, which is kind of scary. Um, and this actually goes, we're going to talk about Socrates later this semester. I might as well do a little bit of an aside, but Socrates was, you know, called the wisest man of his, of his day. And he doubted that because he knew, um, how ignorant he was. And he went out and tried to find a wise man. And he talked to people and realized after interviewing all kinds of people that there was nobody out there that had knowledge, right? There was nobody that was wise. And he was maybe, you know, one step above them in that he's at least aware of his own ignorance, whereas most people don't even realize how ignorant they are. So yeah, we want to try to avoid ignorance. We want to tr transcend the present, find meaning, right? Humanities also deals with big questions and how other people have dealt with big questions. Uh, human beings like to have a sense of purpose in life. And there's all kinds of questions as to whether we find that purpose or whether we create that purpose. But human beings need purpose, right? We need meaning uh, to avoid you know, desperation. It's a whole question among the existential philosophers. Uh, next is to examine universal aspects of creative expression. There are uh, aspects of culture that are universal, meaning they show up in all cultures. And uh, some of those are the big questions, questions of human existence. Everybody asks those questions, doesn't matter where, when you live. Next, we want to see the things that endure over time, really the important uh, works of art, the important styles, the important um, phenomena, as opposed to just these short-lived fads that we encounter all the time today. Uh, we also want to be able to enjoy this stuff. I mean, some of these things that we're going to look at are really masterpieces. There should be an emotional response that you have to a great work of art, and they should be enjoyable, right? If you enjoy beauty, you know, some of you may be very much into music and art. Um, you know, you may have different tastes, but uh, there's still a human side of ourselves that uh, enjoys those types of things. And then the last one is just to become more human. And I, I actually put that in from kind of a philosophical perspective. We'll study Aristotle later this semester as well. And um, kind of the Aristotelian tradition believes that as you develop more and more of your potentials, you literally become more of what it means to be human, right? The less you engage your intellect, the less human you are. I mean, one of the uh, distinct, distinguishing features of humanity above other animals uh, in that tradition is that we are rational beings. And if we don't engage our rationality and don't develop, uh, hopefully towards wisdom, which is a virtue of the rationality, then you're actually living a less than human existence. You're actually living more like an animal um, than a human. So the more you um, develop your creativity, develop virtue, develop wisdom, knowledge, and all those other things, you actually become more of something. And I know when I write, you know, become more human, there seems to be an implication that some people are less human than others. And I don't mean that in any sense, which would be like, like some people aren't as valuable as others. I do believe in obviously human equality, but um, I, I mean that in a very specific way. So hopefully that makes sense. Okay, let's look at the areas of focus for the semester. I'm going to go through these kind of quickly if the thing works for me. Here we go. All right. Six basic areas. The textbook covers more than these, but I wanted to restrict it a little bit. The course is broad enough as it is, right? It's Humanities One. Um, it's going to cover history, religion, philosophy, art, architecture, literature, obviously in a cursory way. It's kind of an introduction to some of these things with restricted time periods and cultures. Now, obviously, you could take an entire course on history. You could take, a take, take an entire course on just Roman history. Uh, you know, the higher up you go in college, you get to grad school, you could take an entire semester studying just one portion of Roman history. Okay, so in a course like this, we're very broad, right? So we're just um, going to do our best to cover as much as we can. Hopefully you guys won't get overwhelmed as we go through this stuff, but here's how I'm going to break the course down. I'm going to be giving you lectures on history, religion, and philosophy, which are basically the background information for the art, architecture, and literature. And those three things are the things you guys are going to be covering in your presentation. So you guys are going to have either an art topic, an architecture topic, or a literature topic. Okay. And it's going to fit in with a lot of the stuff I've already been talking about as far as the culture, the context. Okay. And then you guys are going to give me the content. Okay. 
So that's how the course is designed. Um, hopefully, let's hope this, okay. Um, do not try, I don't think I made this poll live. Um, this is the software I was trying to avoid, but apparently there was another slide in here. Um, I'm not gonna mess with that. Hopefully we won't get shut down. If things black out, this would probably be when they happen. But using WebEx, you can do this in the chat function, or you can even unmute your microphone if you want. The question is, how would you classify the things I'm bringing up on the screen? All right, and in one of those six ways, uh, you can kind of see them, they all got grouped together there. History, philosophy, religion, art, architecture, or literature. Um, since the polling software doesn't work, I don't want you guys, it would be cool if it did. You guys could put your answers right there on my screen. But the Trojan War, who has an idea of where that would fall? Is it history? Is it philosophy? Is it art? Is it religion? Is it literature? Somebody give me an idea how you would classify it. Okay, so I'm going to say history. I've got a couple people saying history. I'll tell you, the Greeks believed it was history, right? It was an account of a war that they believed actually happened. Maybe you, maybe you guys have actually heard um, mention that there is a city of Troy. They found the city of Troy. And um, there may be elements to the story that we have that were historical. It's hard to know for sure, but there seems to be a kernel of history in there. Any other way you might classify it besides history? All right, literature, very good. Um, a number of the greatest early works of literature actually involved the Trojan War, particularly the Iliad, the Odyssey, which we're going to look at later when we talk about Homer. Any others? Anybody know certain characters that show up in works like the Iliad and the Odyssey that we don't expect to show up in a normal history work? Religion, right, gods. Okay, so you've got a lot of things going on. And that's going to be the way it is for a number of these. It's going to be hard to classify as just one thing. The next one, what about questions regarding right and wrong? What we might call moral questions or ethical questions. Where would that fall? Okay, philosophy. Very good. There are entire courses on ethics. I actually teach an ethics course. Um, it's one of my favorite classes to teach. Again, I didn't go through my background, but uh, just so you know, and you probably figure this as you notice how I have my lectures structured, my background is in archaeology. I've got my master's degree in uh, classics, particularly Greco-Roman studies. Um, also, a master's degree in philosophy, so those are the areas that I tend to hover around the most. Okay, religion as well. Very good, very good. Let's go to the next one. Views regarding the human soul. What do you think of that one, human soul? Art, okay. Yes, art deals with that. Again, the word soul is a little bit vague. Religion, right? There are religious conceptions of the soul. Uh, there are also philosophical conceptions of the soul, okay? So it doesn't have to be a religious conversation to be able to talk about the human soul, whatever that is. Yeah, all of them would work again. Uh, maybe not architecture so directly, though. You could have art incorporated into architecture that deals with those types of things, too. So, yeah. What about a drama that investigates a subject like fate or a theme like fate? We're going to read a drama that does this later on this semester. Literature, right. Very good. Kind of gave it away when I said we're going to read. Um, you may have read dramas before. Uh, and originally, they were meant to be performed, not just read. So it is an art, performance art, okay, art, literature, throw in religion, philosophy here too. Let's look at some visuals. What are we seeing right there? I'm sure you've seen something like that. You don't need to know the specific. Okay, Greek temple. Really good, really good. Right, it's a temple for a god or goddess. Uh, I believe this is the temple to Aphea. Um, it might, people usually say, that's the Parthenon. Um, or even worse, they say the Pantheon. Uh, we're going to study both of those buildings later on. But um, yeah, it is a Greek temple. And it's a religious construction, obviously. And as a temple, it's also what? Architecture, very good. And there's lots of art usually incorporated into Greek architecture, so um, sculpture and whatnot, so that's there. What about this one? And I'm not looking at the building behind 
the monument, but the monument itself, I'm not going to say what it is, and I know it's not necessarily going to be that big on your screen, but anybody have a guess what this might be? It's one of the most, I personally think it's one of the most magnificent pieces in Rome. This happens to be in Rome. I will tell you the building behind it is a church, um, but this is not in any way connected to the church. This was there long, long before the church was there. Any guesses? No idea. Okay, it's actually called, it's a column. So it's an architectural element, just like the temple to the left. You see those columns that hold up the architrave, but this is a freestanding column that never really held up anything other than a statue. So it's a monument. Trajan, really good. No, it's not Dante. Um, it is Trajan's column in Rome. It is a monument to a historical uh, war, his campaign against Dacia. So it is history. It is art. Um, you can't see really carefully, but if you zoomed in real close, the spiraling band that goes all the way up the column is like one long illustrated account of this historical event. So it's art. It's history. Um, today, there's a statue of St. Peter on the top. It used to be a statue of Trajan. So I guess you could say there's some connections to religion. Um, matter of fact, this is probably where Trajan, I believe, where his... Uh, ashes would have been deposited in the base of the column. Um, but it's also architectural, obviously, the column design. As a matter of fact, there's a stairway inside. This is a huge column, so you can actually climb up to the top of it, though nobody's allowed to do that. So yeah, it's, it's a number of these things. Um, last one, I'm just going to go through this one real quick because I want to get to the rest of the PowerPoint. But this is a Cycladic marble figurine from the um, really Calcolithic, early Bronze Age in the Aegean world. We're going to look at that world uh, in a couple of weeks with the you know, early Greece, but um, the Cycladic Islands, we find these figurines, particularly in graves. Um, it's art. We don't know the significance religiously, but they're found in graves, so there's probably some kind of religious connection. The um, figure here is one that would not be able to stand up on its own. It would be laying down, the feet are pointed down, but you also have other figures very similar, again, usually with not much by way of uh, facial expression, uh, playing instruments and doing other things. But again, it's art, possibly religion, um, and so on. Okay, so again, as we look through the semester, we're going to actually have overlap between all these different areas. So let's talk about the historical periods. If you guys have a question, go ahead and text it. I'm not going to pause because I know we're getting close to our time limit, but I'm going to go a little bit beyond that to make sure I wrap this up. A historical period is any interval of time that is unified somehow. And the things that would unify a period of time could be culture, ideology, technology, and so on. So for instance, we could talk about like the World War II generation or the era of World War II. That would be an interval of time unified by particular world events. Okay. Technology, we could talk about the nuclear age. You could go back and talk about the... Uh, Iron Age, the Bronze Age, and, and the Stone Age, right? You can keep going back. Those would be intervals of time defined by technology. And just so you know, <clears throat> when we talk about something being like the Bronze Age, that's not an, uh, a particular set uh, date that covers the entire world, right? So that like the Bronze Age in the Middle East would be a little bit different than the Bronze Age in maybe Britain, Okay, ancient Britain. Okay, because technology travels to different places at different times. So one place could still be, you know, Stone Age technology there, where other people are already using, you know, iron weapons elsewhere. Okay, so those are relative terms depending on where we're talking and you know who we're talking about. The largest periods are going to be these: the ancient, the medieval, and the modern. Those are the general breakdowns. Um, you know, pretty much prior to 3500 BC, you're in what's essentially prehistory. Okay, you don't have dinosaurs necessarily roaming around with people, but it's it's prehistory and that that's prior to writing. But the ancient world, we're going to say 3500 to about 500. We're going to cover that time period in this class, as well as part a part of the medieval world. Okay, the medieval world basically 500 AD to 1500. All right, so. As far as the ancient world goes, we're going to be looking at the cultures restricted to Mesopotamia, the Near East, ancient Greece, Rome, Italy, uh, uh, Greece and Rome, 
And then when we get into the Middle Ages, we're going to be dealing with the early and middle or high Middle Ages. Um, may touch a little bit on the late Middle Ages, but we're not going to get very far beyond that. We will not be dealing with the modern humanities, okay? Renaissance forward, we're not going to touch. Though the Renaissance is a period that does reflect a lot of ancient Greek and Roman influence, and if you guys want to write a term paper on something from the Renaissance, I'm usually cool with that, okay? So, how to understand humanities, uh, let's just cover a few things. At the end, I'll go through some definitions. Um, we could talk about cultural styles. Those would be combinations of different artistic and literary modes of expression that define different era or schools. And those change over time. Sometimes you'll have multiple styles occurring in the same era. Um, sometimes they occur successively, or one style follows another. So there can be evolution in cultural style. Right? So historically, you could have numerous styles simultaneously or successively, and a cultural style may prevail over the boundaries of different periods. So for instance, I just mentioned the Renaissance. One of the cultural styles that shows up in the Renaissance is a revival of the classical styles found in ancient Greece. Basically, 5th century Greek world was the classical era, and their style of sculpture and representation uh, is picked up in the Renaissance. But it's also picked up in the um, golden era of Rome, right, uh, which would be Augustan Rome, um, a re, uh, not discovery, but uh, really embracing of that Greek style from centuries earlier. So this is a style that's come up multiple times throughout history, and even today there are artists that, that favor that style and still work in that style, okay? So now to understand what we're going to look at throughout the semester, I want you guys to realize that there's a bit of subjective it, subjectivity and that you guys are going to have reactions to works of art. Um, maybe you guys love stuff, right? You might have an emotional response of awe or wonder or uh, whatever, um, you know, a response to beauty. Others may look at something and say, that's disgusting. It's ugly. I don't like it. And that would be a different emotional response. Some of you may be apathetic, um, but you're going to have some response at some point. What you want to do as you try to objectively investigate what we're looking at is enjoy your emotional subjective response, but try to go beyond it. Try to look for what's the meaning here? What was the artist trying to do? Do they do it well? How does this work of art or this work of literature fit with some of the ideas that we've been talking about? Um, if you understand the history of certain things, you'll understand a little bit more about what's going on in um, certain things. So for instance, if anybody, somebody, I remember mentioned Dante. Yet yeah, there it is in the text. Um, uh, somebody mentioned Dante. If you've ever read the uh, Divine Comedy, uh, the, 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 particularly the Inferno, you know, Dante places all kinds of characters in different levels of hell that are actual historical figures from around his time, from, you know, Renaissance Florence and the politics of, you know, Renaissance Italy, that you wouldn't have any idea who these guys are that he's talking about, unless you understand a little bit about the history of his time and his life. Okay, so um, that's where the context and content um, kind of connect. So we can talk about formalism which is where we analyze the content or the form. Uh, actually, I shouldn't say content, but the form of the work. And then the contextualism is where we're going to look at the um, factors outside of a work of art. So for instance, this is how I said the course is broken down. I'm going to give you context, right? I'm going to give you the historical backgrounds. I'm going to give you a little bit about the ideas circulating, the religious beliefs of a, of a people. And then in your presentations, you're going to be dealing with the form. Right, you're going to look at the work of art itself. So you're going to talk about medium, technique. Those are just ideas about what types of things you could look at as you do your presentations. You don't need to cover everything. Um, those are kind of guides in the um, document that I gave you about um, presentation guidelines. I mentioned some of these things, so keep those in mind. Okay, so form and context are both imp both important. And when I said a second ago, we want to know, you know, what was the goal of the artist? A lot of times there is no way to know that without making some kind of speculative guess, which is kind of redundant. But uh, a lot of times we don't even know who the artist was that produced, particularly in ancient art, right? I don't know who made this. I don't know why they made it. If they don't tell me, you know, the best I have is a guess. Um, I can start to look at, you know, one work of art in comparison with other works of art within the same time period. And if I know a little bit about the history, I might be able to make educated guesses. But, you know, the context is going to help you figure some things out. And 
I don't know if you guys like detective work, but archaeology happens to be one big detective story, and some of this is kind of fun to try to figure out if you can. Okay, let's walk through a couple pieces, and then I'll just give you a list of vocabulary that I'll show, but I won't go over. I want to show you a work of art and a work of literature and kind of walk you through formal and contextual analysis, just kind of bullet point format. This could be a guide for your presentations if you want to handle it in a similar manner. Uh, you don't have to, but if you look at the, the picture on the screen, you might know what this is. You could text answers on the side if you want, but the medium, what, what is this? Medium would be the method of communicating a message to an audience, right? The medium is the thing through which the message is communicated. It's the middle, right? So anybody know what we're looking at here? It's not a trick question. You may have one of these in your house. If you tip it over, it might, it's, a, it's a vase. Very good. Okay, so we're looking at ceramics. We're looking at pottery. Now, this is probably not a type of piece you'd have in your home because it's pretty old. The technique, specific technique, this is actually called black figure pottery. We're going to study a lot of this stuff later, so I'm just going to kind of go through them quickly now. There's the theme involved, which is heroism. If you look at the top, the neck of the amphora, you're going to see a scene where you've got a hero and a monster engaged in a type of combat. If you don't know who that is, it actually is written on the thing, but you can't see that. It uh, has to do with the plot being that of the story of Heracles, a character you may know better as Hercules, and that's him, and he's killing a character who really deserves to be killed. It is a character by the name of Nessos, who is a centaur. Okay, very good. You got a centaur. Nice. I should have waited to look at the text before I said it. Um, if I had bonus points, I would give them to you. Yeah, a centaur, half human, half horse. And this particular centaur, if you know the story of Heracles, I know somebody said they were in a humanities uh, mythology class. If you were in my mythology class, you definitely read the story of Heracles. But Nessus attempted to rape Heracles' wife, uh, Deanira, um, and uh, he got killed for it. <laughs> Anyways, the setting is the heroic age. The imagery is obviously monsters. At the top, Nessus is technically a monster, but the monsters in the around the, the main portion of the, of the amphora are gorgons. You might not be able to tell uh, unless you are familiar with Greek art, but you have this really large head and this tongue which is protruding between these fangs and these wings on the back. Um, these are gorgons. You probably heard of them if you know the name Medusa. She's the most famous of the gorgons. But they're, they're, they're the symbols of fear. So again, here you got the symbol, fear, forces of nature. Right, um, the hero versus the wild. That's kind of the theme of the of the vase. Now, what's the context? Well, it's created for burial. This happens to be a burial urn. The Greeks practiced cremation, so that's the cultural event which led to a production of something like this. If you don't practice cremation, you probably don't make burial urns. Um, I called it an amphora. Um, a little bit of a. Of a contradiction in what I've said, so I apologize for that. Um, the artist is the Nessos painter. Uh, that's just a name that we've come up with. We don't know his actual name, but it's based on this particular work. Late 7th century, it was from the Karamikos region in Attica, which is near, it's right at Athens, basically. Uh, and incidentally, Karamikos is the potter's quarter. It's also the cemetery area where <clears throat> we get the name ceramics from. Right, Karamikos is the, the actual place name, but we call things ceramics because this was such an important place in the history of development of ceramic style. And it actually shows an influence from an earlier style that was Corinthian style, um, which affects what's called black figure and the evolution of Greek vase painting. Okay, So that's how you could go through and analyze a work like this. Of course, there's a lot more you could say about it. Let's take a look at this. This will be the last major thing to look at in the PowerPoint, but what I give you here is an excerpt from a a work of literature. I'm not going to tell you what it is, but you might be able to take a guess. Feel free to type that on the side. You have speakers and a little bit of description, right? So you've got chorus leader speaking. Then you've got this description that says, enter agave, cradling the head of Pentheus. So it's kind of giving you um, a description of what's happening. And then it goes back to people talking, right? You got the chorus leader, and then the chorus is engaged in a conversation with this woman, agave. 
Okay, I'm not going to read through it, but what does it look like? What type of literature is this? I'm tempted to start reading it. It's a wonderful scene. I'll tell you a little bit about it in a second. Has anybody read something like this, maybe in high school, middle school? Maybe not by this author, but nobody has a guess. It's a play. Good. Grecian performance art. It is a drama. In particular, it's a tragedy. We'll talk about Greek drama later. Um, there are a couple types of drama, comedies, tragedies uh, among them. The uh, tragedy here, uh, let's just go through the medium. I'll kind of point out things as we go. So the medium is drama. The genre is tragedy, which I just said. The theme here happens to be skepticism and piety. It's a play known as the Bacchae by Euripides. Okay, so I'll give you that in a second. But um, in this particular scene, you get this woman, Agave, who's coming back into the city of Thebes, and she's carrying in her hands the head of her son, which she just ripped off of his body. Okay, kind of gruesome uh, play. Now, she doesn't know it's her son's head because she's been driven insane by the god Dionysus in the play. The chorus knows it's her son's head. They could see it, and they're horrified. She thinks she has the head of a mountain lion and that she just you know made this wonderful kill while she was out in the woods. So um, it has to do with this, uh, Pentheus is this character in the play who's very skeptical of Dionysus and suspicious of Dionysus and refuses to worship the god. And basically he is done in by his rejection of the god Dionysus. So the plot um, is basically sur surrounding Dionysus's visit to Thebes, which is his hometown. Um, the characters, Pentheus and Agave, two of the most important in the, in the play, it's set in the heroic age. It is tragic irony. The symbol in this scene happens to be decapitation, um, and that would be a symbol for reason or the loss of reason, right? The head is the seat of our our knowledge, our, our, our wisdom, hopefully. And uh, when you have a decapitation, it's this idea of you know being uh, a loss of reason, right? The Pentheus has his head ripped off because he's um, you know placed reason too high. Um, and in a way has become, in, in some ways, foolish in doing so. Anyways, contextual analysis, it's entertainment. That's why it was created. It's a response to the growing popularity of a real cult, and we'll talk about mystery cults in this class as well, the cult of Dionysus, known as the Bacchic cult. That was popular at the time. It was by Euripides, one of the three great tragedians of 5th century Athens. The time, 5th century place, Athens, just said that. And how does this work fit in with other works by the same author? Well, some people say it's a little bit less critical of religious belief. Uh, Euripides himself was, you know, critical of certain, um, you know, traditional beliefs and things like that. So um, this one seems to be a little bit more pious than others. All right. So walked you through those two. What would happen next, and I'm like I said, I'm not going to go through these. I'm just going to bring these up on the screen so that if you're watching this video, you could pause it and read through some of these definitions if you want the definitions. But they're vocabulary terms that are relative to art and the analysis of humanities. Okay, so there are general definitions here. What I mean when I talk about an audience or the composition in a work of literature or art um, what we mean by genre and medium and style, those types of things. You're probably familiar with a lot of these um, literary specific prose versus poetry. Um, again, genre. And then you've got tragedy, comedy, plot. Okay, those deal with um, you know drama terms and other types of literature. So you've got definitions there. Again, you could pause it and read through some of those on your own. And then the last slide, uh, also dealing with literary analysis, you know, what do we mean by character, right? What's a protagonist? What's an antagonist? Um, what's a static character versus um, a dynamic character? Verisimilitude, what is that? It's a big word. Um, that just has to do with, you know, the authenticity. How believable is the, um, the story? How... how how realistic are the characters? And I don't mean is it believable on all levels. Like, for instance, if you ever watch Lord of the Rings, wonderful movie. I'm a huge Tolkien fan. Um, you may say, well, that's not very believable, right? You've got you know, wizardry. You've got monsters and orcs and all kinds of things going on that are not believable. But when I say does the story have verisimilitude, I'm not talking about 
is it absent of you know fantastic elements? I'm talking about the authenticity and the reaction of the characters. How relatable are the characters? How much like real human beings are they? Uh, and in a certain way, I think Tolkien has a lot of verisimilitude. Okay, so anyways, other terms, you know, narrator, different perspectives, points of view, POV, point of view, uh, drama, explication, um, and then some for fine art analysis, like what's the difference between representational and abstract art? What is perspective? You know, line, color, composition, setting, etc. Okay. Anyways, let me come back here, and I think things are still working. I don't know why the, the screen shut off for some reason, but I think we're still good. Um, you all can still hear me. Do you have any questions at this point? Sorry, I should probably get rid of that. Okay, any questions at the end of the lecture? That's just introductory stuff. Hopefully it hasn't frightened you how much we're going to cover this semester. I hope that it's all going to be enjoyable. I mean, this is stuff that I love. I see there's no questions, at least from one person. Um, I'll, I'll have a tendency because I do. It's weird. I've been teaching this class for close to 20 years now um, at the college. And I sometimes get just as carried away and excited about this stuff as I did years ago when I, when I first started doing it. So every once in a while, I'm going to start talking about something and go off in different directions. So I apologize if I have a tendency to do that. Question, is the Bacchus Cook related to the uh, naming of Bacchus in any way? Yes, it is. Yeah. A lot of times if you've studied mythology, you may see people say Dionysus is like the Greek god of wine and then Bacchus is like a, his Roman counterpart. Strictly speaking, Bacchus is also um, used of, of, of Dionysus in Dion I mean, both names are used in both cultures, Greek, Roman. Um, it's the exact same person. So yeah, Bacchic cult is the cult of Dionysus. I'll refer to the cult later as the Bacchic cult or the um, cult of Dionysus. Yeah, very, very interesting cult. A lot of the mystery cults are, are kind of fascinating, partly because we don't know exactly what they did. And there's all kinds of, you know, speculation. And some of the speculation gets uh, blown out of hand um, or out of proportion to what may have actually been the case. But Again, they're fun stories. So, other questions before I let you go? If not, I will see you next session, hopefully. Um, and like I said, I'll get these videos uploaded so that you have access to them and can review, especially those that weren't able to join us. But thanks for joining me. If you do have questions after I log us out of the session, feel free to email me, and I will talk to you guys in a couple days. All right. You're welcome. Bye-bye.